Backpackers will be granted special visa benefits as part of a new program aimed at fast-tracking the bushfire rebuild and boosting tourism. The Working Holiday Maker program encourages backpackers to move into 45 declared disaster zones to help repair homes, fences and farms. Travellers in those areas will be allowed to stay with the same employer for one, for one year. Volunteering could go towards securing second and third year visas. Let's go live to Melbourne now. Liberal MP Tim Wilson uh, joins us. Tim Wilson, good to see you. We've all seen the impact of these bushfires across several states over uh, summer. Uh, backpacker visas are usually reserved for going to fruit picking regional areas. Do you think this could be a, a long-term initiative? Uh, I think we should look at it as a short-term initiative. We have an immediate challenge around rebuilding the communities that have been fire affected this season. Uh, obviously everyone will look and monitor it very closely about whether it's been effective, uh, but the most important thing is we get the labour in those communities to help them rebuild uh, the broken lives and broken homes and broken infrastructure uh, and to get those local economies moving. If it's successful, I'm sure there'll be a reassessment uh, based on future, future need. And is this about looking, not just looking at the immediate response that is needed now, but also looking a year, uh, maybe a couple of years down the track, because it is going to take that long to rebuild, isn't it? Uh, it will, and we also need to make sure that we continue to have backpackers coming to Australia to uh, invest in our tourism destinations because of course we know that tourism particularly in parts of the country are doing it tough uh, so by getting people here providing them a pathway for work but also to enjoy all the wonder and bounty that Australia has to offer for people to spend money uh, domestically actually achieves lots of objectives for all of us uh, and that will obviously have a downflow effect also on uh, making sure that we have the skilled labour force we need uh, for many of those tourism sectors as well as reconstruction constructing jobs as well as fruit picking as you outlined. Yeah, let's look at the housing data we've <coughs> seen from the government this morning as well. The first home buyers uh, grant given to uh, those who are buying their first home obviously. They're looking outside of the three capital cities. Uh, is this what this scheme expected to achieve? A, a regional um, housing boom perhaps? Well, what we want is people to be able to get housing at affordable prices near places where people can get jobs. Now, if people are finding, young families are finding, first home buyers are finding that they can secure a healthy, happy lifestyle for them and their families in rural and regional Australia, then that's fantastic because uh, it means that our regional cities are doing well. It means that there are job opportunities where people are seeking them. And it also means that we're, uh, shall we say, sharing the population load across the country rather than just trying to cram more people into our capital cities. Did it surprise you that, it was a small uptake, but there was about 11% of people between the age of 40 and 59 that were using this First Home Buyers initiative. Is it concerning uh, in Australia where, you know, the great Australian dream of owning your own home is first and, and foremost, that people are only looking at buying their first home in their 40s or 50s? Well, Laura, you know I'm not somebody who likes to tell other people how to live their lives. True. Uh, some people uh, might have been travelling overseas um, and some people might have been working elsewhere. Mm. So there are plenty of reasons why people might be in a situation where they're buying their first home uh, later in life. But yes, we want people to be able to live out the Australian dream, uh, to get a good education, to be able to get a good and well-paying job, uh, to, uh, these days it includes everybody, get married uh, and form a family, of course, go on and buy a house. Uh, and uh, those should be the aspirations that we want for Australians uh, so that they can get mm. on with their lives and build the foundations of a great country. Are you keeping on the banks here? Are they doing the right thing in terms of uh, setting interest rates in line with historical lows <laughs> that we've seen for this uh, particular grant? Uh, well, I mean, banks are obviously being scrutinised against their behaviour, against this, against the uh, first homeowners uh, loan deposit scheme, uh, and we're making sure that banks are doing the right things. These are the sort of things we scrutinise in the Economics Committee, and we've got the banks coming up in a couple of months, and I'm sure we'll ask lots of questions of them there. OK, I'm sure you will. Let's move on to emissions now. Under the Paris Agreement, which Australia signed up to under the previous government, is it correct to say that under that agreement all countries agreed to moving towards net zero emissions before, by 2050? Wasn't that part of the whole apparatus? 
What the Paris Agreement does uh, is say that by the uh, second half of this century that it's the intention of parties to stabilise emissions to only see 1.5 degrees of warming. Now, if you go off the research of the uh, or the evidence base of the International Intergovernmental Cli Panel on Climate Change, that says that we need to re reach net zero emissions by uh, 2050. Now, so there's an indirect discussion around it, but not an explicit one. But the government, and last week uh, the minister, Angus Taylor, outlined uh, that the government was looking to a strategy to achieve such a target uh, over the next few years. Uh, I'll map out a strategy to get there. We've got the technology roadmap, which I understand is going to come out shortly, which is going to outline how we can use technology to cut our greenhouse gas emissions from things like you know, in, uh, stationary energy and transportable energy, but we've also got to confront the emissions that come from things like mining and agriculture mm. and uh, land use as well. So the government is working out a roadmap to get to zero net emissions by 2050. Well, the Prime Minister's been quite explicit that uh, he, he's happy to consider these sorts of possibilities, uh, but it's going to be done on the back of what the impact is on people's lifestyles and jobs, mm. uh, and that he's not going to commit to something without knowing the full consequences of it. And that seems to me to be an eminently sensible approach, because you've got to take the Australian community with you. There was a suggestion this week from uh, one of your Nationals colleagues in New South Wales that zero net emissions by 2050 could mean the end of agriculture. Uh, well, I don't think we're going to see the end of agriculture in this country and I don't want to see the end of agriculture in this country. Mm. It's a vitally important primary industry that, like other sectors, like mining, provide the foundations of the Australian economy. If you don't have mining, if you don't have agriculture, if you don't have aquaculture, then you won't have uh, secondary industries like manufacturing, let alone the service-based jobs. So that's why the focus of the government is to build the foundations in both in the economy and in emissions cuts from the bottom up uh, so that we can keep people's jobs and make sure we cut emissions and take the Australian community with us. And have you been given an indication when a decision might be made on this? Uh, well, I haven't had that conversation, but uh, the government's clearly taking uh, the challenge of reducing our emissions okay. very seriously. We've set our targets to the end of 2030, as you know. We've taken them to two elections in a row and we'll meet them and hopefully beat them. Uh, but there's a discussion now about what our targets are beyond 2030. Tim Wilson, we'll speak to you soon. Thank you.